I'm glad you've joined once again here at Midweek Manna. We are, oh, we're into this wonderful study together uh, from the book of Romans. We are getting into the meatiest part uh, of Romans. Again, this letter, this book, as we call it to this day, uh, is so vital to us, so, so, so vital to us. And uh, I just know you're enjoying this study together. Please get the word out. Again, I'm just going to remind you a little bit each time that we gather. Uh, again, we are learning things and adjusting things. And as I shared the last time we were together, you know, I still want to hear from some of the rest of you on uh, what is your uh, quality time of the week that you would like to sit down uh, and uh, study together. Uh, in other words, we're looking for a different night other than Wednesday at 7 to be the launch uh, for the week. Uh, if Tuesdays are good for you, Thursdays are good for you, Saturday mornings, whatever the case, uh, I'll just gather all that information and do the best we can. What we're trying to do is now take this to another level uh, by you continuing uh, and by your effort of talking to family or friends or neighbors. Uh, again, just sharing about, hey, if you don't have a good quality Bible study, why don't you join with me or you can on your own. Just tell them how to get here to Midweek Manna. Uh, but that first hour that it launches for the week uh, can uh, open up the door to others that are not attenders or members of Grace Life Church. And they may have a pop-up, and it's like, okay, I'll watch this. Hey, I like that. Yeah, I like that format. It's simple enough, but it, it gets deep enough that it doesn't lose me, and it makes me want to study more of my own. And who knows uh, the good that can come out of it. But they'll never know we're out there unless we get uh, more algorithms just saying, hey, uh, you might be interested in this. So well, I'm just going to keep that before you uh, as we advance. Today, we're going to chapter 6. Uh, but I would like to uh, go back just a moment to chapter 5. That's what we shared the last time we were together. Now, if you weren't with us, please go back and, and look at it. It is chapter 5 that... Um, has been studied more than any other passage in all of Scripture, especially New Testament. Uh, it it's opening up to verses to chapter six and seven and eight, and uh, we have so much here um, for foundation of understanding what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live by faith, what it means to have right relationship with God. Uh, all these things, chapter 5, was telling us it's by uh, this privilege that we can come into the presence of God and to obtain grace. Uh, and how do we do that? It comes by faith. And faith is greater than works. Now, again, we know in Scripture, and we will read it in, in the next few times together, uh, where Paul tells us now, you know, if, if uh, you have works, then show me your faith. If you have faith, then show me your works. They work together. But independently, works will fall short because, again, works just in itself promotes self. And it's not enough. We are saved by grace, as Paul would write to the Ephesian church, uh, the church in Ephesus, that we are saved by grace and not by works that any man should boast. So he's just reinforcing all that. Here he's writing to this group in Rome wanting to get there and wanting it to take it into all the world, the citadel of the earth at that time, to come back to understand how important faith is. And that faith gets us to a place where we can have a right relationship with God. If it's just about works, we're, we don't know how to get to God. We just allude that, God, I, I know that you're watching, and I trust that you're pleased. 
faith tells us, no, I can come into the throne room. And so it is also chapter 5 is where, as I shared last time, the verse that, that the Holy Spirit led me to, we, we had gone forever thinking about renaming the church here from Marietta Church of God to, and it was through that process that I was led to chapter 5. And verse 17 tells us that through one man's disobedience that sin reigned in everybody's life. However, if we will receive the abundance of grace, we may reign in life ourselves. Grace, life. And again, that was through Jesus, his sacrifice, his obedience. So through the solidarity that comes through the first man, Adam's sin, and we all had sinned and we're born into sin, it is now through one man's obedience, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, that allows us the privilege to choose him, that we may reign in life. Wow. So now let's move on to chapter 6. I would like to read the first 11 verses. Follow with me. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also might consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So it's this understanding of the Spirit. Of, of dying to live. Um, so Paul argues with us as we talk about grace. Oh, there's grace now, so I can just sin all that I want to. It made me think of someone I knew who no longer is alive, and I won't name the name, but you might identify if you're a diabetic and if your diabetes is severe. And of course, those of you that are diabetic, you know that you have to be good stewards of your body and you, you have to watch over it with, with diligence. Depending on the severity of it, the injections, of course, of insulin and how many uh, injections that you take, the volume of it. Well, this individual uh, loved to eat, but not only enjoyed eating, but just would eat 
this stuff that he probably shouldn't have ever eaten, knowing that he's diabetic for sure. And so, of course, you know, doing the injections, doing the injections, pricking the finger, seeing where you are, seeing the glucose. And uh, finally, they came out with the, with the insulin pump, right? And I'll never forget the day he came up to me and said, man, in this great day, he said, I've got this insulin pump. Now I can eat all that I want to, when I want to, as much as I want to, and that pump is just taking care of it. <laughs> Kidding me? But he allowed himself to think in error. It cost him his life. The diabetes cost him his life, eventually. And so it is with sin. Can I just sin now because of grace? Hey, it doesn't count anymore. It does count. And uh, so, you know, we, we understand the purpose of why Jesus died. He died to sin so that we can be set from it. He didn't do it for his own credit. He didn't do it for his own merit. He had us in mind. And this is why uh, not only being an ordinance of the church, but we are commissioned to also follow in water baptism. And that's why water baptism is always so important to me. I, I, as a minister, as a pastor, I really don't know of anything that gives me any more delight. I mean, you have responsibilities as a shepherd. <clears throat> it is an honor to dedicate children unto the Lord, be a part of that process. It is an honor to be called upon to unite two lives into marriage. It is uh, a great honor to have a farewell, uh, a homegoing service, a funeral service, memorial service, especially for someone who, who lived life so well and honored the Lord. But water baptism, um, it just is so important. And the visual of it, the communication of it, uh, that watery grave, and for the body to be fully immersed into that watery grave, going in one way and coming out another. The visual again, we go in dry and we come out wet. We go in with sin. We come out free from sin. To understand, again, that watery grave of this is who I used to be. This is the old man. This is the new man. This is the old garment. These are the new garments. I mean, the whole process of transformation, the visual of it, in a moment, in an instant, we know when it comes to the, the rapture of the church that the Bible describes as a catching away. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall raise it first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the skies, to be with the Lord forevermore. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. So as quick as a water baptism experience is, someone going under the water and coming out, now, even, and you know that I have been known momentarily from random times to be a smart Um, And so maybe before water baptism, I'll talk to an individual and just kind of chide with them that, you know, I may hold you under the water longer than the rest of them. I may need to hold you under five or six minutes to see if you survive it so that you really get the whole impact of what this is. Of course, I don't do that. But, you know, to, to listen, to take it for what it is, no longer than it takes for a person to be put under the water table and to come out. This is the communication to us of the Spirit, that we die to sin and we become alive to Christ. To understand, and the wording here, of course, is to be in Christ. I, I, I love that formation of the short sentence, that, that, that understanding that I no longer am an individual. I no longer, by solidarity, am a member of the human race that is born in sin 
and destined to an absence of God. I now am in Christ. I don't just know about Christ. I don't know of Christ. I'm in Christ. The solidarity, again, I'm part of the family of God. This is why, again, the, the language of the Bible, with God the Father and Jesus the Son, to, to understand I'm, I'm in that family now. I'm in the church. I'm, I'm in his life. He's in my life. I love John 15. You know that. If we abide in him and he abides in us, if we abide in his word, his word abides in us, uh, he is the vine and we are the branches. And, you know, we, we get our life source from the vine. Outside of him, I can do nothing. But in him, all things are possible. Oh, I may be purged, but it's only to produce yet even more. Oh, the imagery of that is is—it's just nothing compares any better, as far as my opinion, than John 15. That was Jesus' uh, uh, wonderful moment going from what we call the Last Supper, just before all his suffering. I mean, he was, he was painting that wonderful portrait for those first followers that we have record of in God's eternal word. So again, we're back to what Paul's arguing. Do I, do I just continue to sin? No, God forbid, uh, because you're no longer who you were. You now are a new creation. Do you see Jesus going around sinning? No, you're in Christ now, so, so you abandon it. Now we know that we're not Jesus, and we know that we have fallen short. We know that we have failed. And that's why it speaks to us. Because of that, we need him to be our redeemer, to set us free, to deliver us. We also know that none of us are perfect. That even though we have acknowledged by faith who Jesus is and truly have become born again, we still battle that old nature. And so, again, we understand, yes, I've been water baptized, and I don't want to sin anymore, but I have. I need to understand, again, what he did for me. He justified me, put me in a position that I can get into his presence as if I don't have sin in my life. This is why, again, the Word of God keeps coming back. And, but if we sin, we have an advocate, Jesus, who became the propitiation for our sin. See, all those scriptures are bearing the truth that he's bringing out here, that we're in Christ. The old Randy's dead. A new Randy became alive and is growing in grace. Let's go on now and begin at verse 12 and just read through verse 14 real quickly. 12 through 14. Let not sin therefore reign. There's that word again, see, that we learned in chapter 5. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members, your body members, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Again, uh, we, we understand what he's telling us, that uh, the visual here for us is to see uh, God as our employer, okay? So, you know, you're going out, got your resume, and you, you need a new job, and God is hiring. <laughs> and you pass the test, and God hires you. And so you understand that uh, 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 now he has control over your life. The same is with sin. 
if you go looking for work and sin is hiring and you get the job and he's your employer, um, you're, you're again realizing you now become, and he's going to go a little deeper and I don't want to get ahead of myself, uh, but you're getting that imagery that now I work for sin. I live for sin or I work for God and I, I live and serve God. Um, again, it's, it's the, um, Paul was trying to bring out the spiritual side of this um, that shows up in everyday practical um, existence. In other words, as we grow in grace, we grow into convictions. We grow into passions. We grow into obedience, even sacrifice. Um, our behavior reflects all of that. So is God our employer? Our lives are going to reflect that. Is sin our employer? Our lives are going to reflect that. I mean, it's just that's, that's bare bones, as simple as it gets. But we understand the privilege of growth. Again, for Grace Life Church, to know him, to be like him, to make him known, or know, grow, show. That growing part of our faith. I'm growing in the knowledge of him. And now I have been convicted of certain things that didn't used to convict me, but I'm living in righteousness now, his righteousness, and I just don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to go there anymore. I, I have a conviction about that. Some convictions you share with others. Others, you just live them out. And other people, why aren't you doing that? Why, well, it's personal. This is something God did for me. Uh, this, that's where he found me, and, and I was saved from that. So why do I want to even get around it? You know, the Bible says abstain from the very appearance of. So I, I, don't, I don't need to be around that. I don't want to be around that. Well, that's growth. Or, you know, when I first got saved, I, I'm just thankful. But now after X amount of time, I want to serve him. There are missionaries that are serving the kingdom that as they first got saved, they probably never had a clue that they'd wind up being a missionary, much less where their assignment would become. And it came through growth. Uh, so again, all these things are a privilege of being in Christ. Let's go on now and uh, read the rest of chapter 6, beginning at verse 15. Chapter 6 and verse 15. Big word here. It's not a popular word today. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do not, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient, here's the word, slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations nor just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, leading uh, uh, to that lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you, uh, excuse me, for when you were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now 
Now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, that word slave. Notice he doesn't use the word servant. And there's a difference. There's similarities, but there's also stark differences. When you're a servant, depending on the culture in which you are that servant, uh, an indentured servant, you may not uh, have many privileges. However, uh, there would be certain understandings, maybe a full written contract but maybe just something that's been passed down uh, uh, through the families, again, depending on the culture. But a servant is one who, yes, I I, I serve that person, that that organization. I still have a mind to think. Uh, I'm given these privileges that I can exercise, uh, as a servant, I have my own quarters. I have certain possessions that are mine. I have liberties. And, you know, it may be all in restraints and parameters, however, you know, you have them. But when you're a slave, you have no privileges. You are owned by that other entity. If you are a slave of a person, you're owned by that person, body, soul, spirit. Everything about you is not your own. That's why today it's a, it's a word that's not liked. Um, and many, it, it brings pain. I'm not taking away from that. But from a biblical position, we understand why he uses that language. Because if you are a slave of God, and it's, that, sounds, that sounds weird, But if you're a slave of God, he owns you, everything about you. And you have no uh, position to come back later. Well, you know, I'll I'll go this far with you, but not all the way. Or uh, I'll do certain things, but I, I refuse to accept these other things. No, it's not what a slave can do. And that really helps us as much as we don't like to think ourselves being a slave, but we we know Paul would write that way. It's because he understood the reversal of it. If I become a slave to sin, we think because we have uh, the liberty to think free moral agents, that to have free will, that I'll choose how involved I'm going to get in sin. I'll choose when I'm going to exercise it. And you may pull that off for a while, but then you'll realize, no, you've become a slave to it. You've been mastered by it. The addiction controls you. That which you you, you formed a habit of, now it, it owns you. To be a slave of sin, there is no grace. There's no option of, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sin when I want to. And uh, no, no, sin says I'm your employer and you're mine. So we come back to the reality of this whole passage here, uh, the boundaries. Um, we understand the contract, the, the understanding of all of that. But free will versus this thing of lawlessness. And we we keep touching on that. And we say, well, you know, if I can get set free from these laws, then, then, then I'm a free person now. No, just as we've already been learning and just adding to that. No, just because there's a spirit of lawlessness driving certain individuals now, certain organizations, certain nations. It doesn't mean that there won't be 
justification of it. it doesn't mean that there won't be a rewarding, that there'll be a judgment. Yes, it's coming. It's coming. And that's why, again, we've been offered this privilege, this privilege of understanding it. And so it simply comes down to this, is that uh, in being a slave uh, to these things, uh, we, we, we need to, to embrace I don't want to just pick and choose what I'll do for the kingdom of God or for God himself. I'm getting the whole picture now. Because if I don't become a slave of God, I'll be a slave to sin. And being a slave of God, the rewards of it. And to understand again the, the privilege that, that we receive. In other words, sanctification. To be set free. He's, he's changing me. I'm, he's growing me. Uh, he's developing me, and and the privilege of understanding again. This is what a good boss does. He develops me, so that I may produce fruit. John fifteen again, and that fruit remains. The parable of the talents. Jesus' own teaching: To whom much is given, much is required. But, but uh, Jesus' teaching on the parable of talents, of, of giving this many talents to this person, this many talents to this person, this many talents to this person, it's not for us to compare who gets more. It's about what we do with what we receive. And if we're faithful to that which he has assigned us to, then he said, I'll make you a rewarder of even greater things. So again, we're, we're right in the, the meat of, of Romans. We're going to conclude this session as well because, again, we just don't want to try to take it all at one time. Just, just again, sit back, take another big breath, and just say, Holy Spirit, just really bring this to full understanding to me. And, and, and where I was afraid of certain words, just like slave, oh, I, I cast myself to you. And I, I want you to have all of me. I, I want to serve you with thanksgiving in my heart. Would you pray with me? Again, we give you thanks and we give you praise, O oh Lord. We thank you for the depth of your word. It's really speaking to us. And we say thank you for giving us an understanding of that which we were ignorant of we might have even stayed away because we felt like it might be taken somewhere that we didn't know we were willing to go. But now we realize, oh my goodness, I still may not understand all of its depth, all of its width, but I want to run to it because I understand now the contrast. If I don't, oh my goodness, I'll go where I don't want to go. I'll do what I don't want to do. So here I am, Lord. Let me have all of you and I want you to have all of me. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Until next time, God bless.